Okay. Good morning. My name is Delmar Larson, and I'm one of the University of California representatives on the Cal OER Organizing Committee. Before we introduce our keynote speaker for the day, I'd like to recognize our sponsors. Next slide, please. We'd like to express our sincere gratitude for these organizations for their generous donation to supporting the inaugural Cal OER Conference, California Community College Open Education Resources Initiative, LibreText, Michelson 20 Million Minds Foundation, California State University Affordable Learning Solutions, and OER Commons. Thank you. Next slide, please. We've been live tweeting conference highlights via our Twitter account. We encourage participants to use the Cal OER 2021 hashtag on online discussions prompted by the conference to encourage greater communication and subsequent review. Next slide, please. Recorded videos of speakers will be available for review on the Pathable website for the following year. A link to the Pathable conference site can be found on the conference website at, cal, at www.caloer.org. Next slide, please. We hope to continue the Cal OER series to facilitate intersegmental OER efforts in the state. Your feedback on the organization and execution of the conference is appreciated. A short survey can be found at the bottom of the Pathable conference home page. Next slide, please. Please note that after our keynote presentation and break, there's an additional session with four presentations starting at one o'clock. Next slide, please. I will hand over the microphone to Michelle Pilati to introduce today's keynote speaker. Thank you, Delmar. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am pleased to introduce our final speaker, Dr. Keith Curry. Dr. Curry is president of Compton College and CEO of the Compton Community College District. Consistent with the intersegmental emphasis of this event, he's a community college leader with a University of California background. Dr. Curry earned his doctorate in educational leadership from the University of California at Irvine and a bachelor's degree in American studies at UC Santa Cruz. His advocacy for students dates back to his time as an undergraduate when he created a program to bring admitted African-American students to the campus so they could learn more about UC Santa Cruz and meet other students. Today, Dr. Curry will share with us his vision for the future of OER and the history that has shaped this vision. Welcome, Dr. Curry. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm excited to be here today to have the opportunity to talk about OER and the work that we're doing at Compton College. I'm excited to share some of my thoughts with you and also be able to take some questions and answer uh, as well. So next slide. So I just wanna talk a little bit, give you a little bit more about me and who I am and this love story that I have with Compton College. Uh, I was born and raised in Compton, California. My relationship with Compton College dates back to uh, fall of 1999 when I was working at the University of California, Irvine as the um, program coordinator with the Early Academic Outreach Program. We actually did an event at Compton College in 1999, a family conference for Compton Unified School District. Um, it was interesting. We had a lot of parents there that for that day and the president from Compton College provided the opening remarks. Uh, I truly believe that every student is a success story. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I was a ball boy for the Compton College football team. Um, and so I have a lot of history at, at, this, at this institution. I actually grew up uh, a block, a block and a half away from the college where I could be there in about five minutes if I hopped the gate uh, on Greenleaf to get into the campus. Um, one thing that's interesting about Compton College is June 7th. Compton College was the first uh, community college uh, in California where accreditation was revoked by the Accrediting Commission. Uh, we entered into a unique partnership with El Camino Community College District to provide academic and student services at the Compton site. So we started out as a center in the fall of 2016. Uh, we achieved initial accreditation on June 7th, 2017. Uh, we have held our first commencement ceremony on June 7th, 2018, and our partnership with El Camino College completed on June 7th, 2019. So I put that out there as June 7th is a significant day in history of Compton College, but it also tells you that anything is possible. So we start thinking about open educational resources and colleges moving forward, we can no longer think it's not possible. Anything is possible, especially when a college whose accreditation was revoked is now fully accredited, that tells you anything is possible. And the work at Compton College is, is based off of the work of the faculty, staff, and the administration in order to get this thing done. Next slide. I'm also a part of a uh, group that works with, it's not a group, it's Pam Lester and myself, 
Pam Lester is the president of San Diego Mesa. And I, we started, uh, it's called the Equity Avengers, where we do presentations about equity and equity-minded presentations for administrators. And also we're dabbling into some work with faculty staff in the future. We have a weekly Twitter show, which is called uh, Equity Chat. Uh, by follow me at I am Keith Curry, you can see the chat and the conversations that we have. It's just a way to have a conversation about uh, student success and the issues in higher education. So individuals have an opportunity and a space to have that conversation and that's on Twitter. Next slide. So I wanted to start today thinking about our own college experience um, and thinking about what we went through as college students. And there's the poll is set up for you on, on the platform. If you can just answer these are yes or no questions, uh, just, to, just to think about, remind yourself about your experience when you were in college. And that is set up right now on the poll. So we'll take a couple of minutes to do that and we'll share the results. So we encourage them to go in um, previously. And one of the questions, there's been a question about a question. You have after high school, did you attend a community college or a four-year university? Is that really after high school, did you attend a community college instead of a four-year university? No, is it basically, did you go to college? Yeah, okay. yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. Did you go, basically, did you go to college? Okay, thank you. Yeah. We had differing interpretations of that question. No <laughs> So the first one we have, yes, right after high school, individual did attend college. What about the second question? Did you struggle in your college level English and math class? Yes, 43% versus no, 57%. Next one. Did you meet with your counselor during your first semester? Yes, 61%, 39%, no. Okay, next one. Twenty percent yes, eighty percent no. Next slide. Next one. Fifty-two percent uh, yes, forty-eight percent no. Regards to financial aid. Next one. Sixty-eight percent yes, thirty-two percent no. Thank you very much. We go back to the slide. I truly believe that. Our own educational experiences help ground us in our decision making as educators as we move forward. Just give a sense of for me, uh, after high school, I attended a four year college. I never took a community college course. Uh, during my undergraduate years, I did struggle with college level English. Uh, my math was okay, but English, I struggled with uh, my transfer level English during my first, my, my, my English course to my first year. Uh, during, during my undergraduate years, did I meet with a counselor? I did not meet with a counselor or advisor until my junior year, when it was time for me to start looking to see how many units I need to, in order to complete. That was problematic because I was behind units and I had to do a catch up plan. And I had to, you know, I, I tell people it's very important to meet with your counselor. Did I experience housing and food insecurity? At that moment, I did not know I was experiencing food insecurity when I was in college, but we were always trying to find ways in regards to food, we'd have enough money for food. And so I was food insecure as I look back at that experience. Did I receive federal financial aid? Yes, I did. And I'm very thankful for that, but I had to also make sure I met the deadlines for financial aid. And did I remember how much I paid? Did I, do I remember how much I paid for books? Yes, I do. And majority of the books that I have for my college experience that I kept were books that the bookstore did not repurchase from me. And I will always tell you that I'm, I'm always telling people, I'm always frustrated that when I was in college, I purchased books and the books were not able to be resold. And now I kept those books. Some I've read again, some I've not, but the bookstore would not resell the books. 
And to me, that's very problematic. Next slide. So I want to start talking about uh, California Community College and the different initiatives and how they ground uh, some of the decision making that I make as a college uh, CEO. Next slide. Since 2010, there's been several bills and initiatives that have came from the state legislators and also the California Community Colleges that uh, you have to organize yourself around this work as college CEOs and as college community college educators. So you look at SB 1440, the transfer bill. You can also look at the Student Success Act. You also look at uh, student equity and the trailer bill language. You can look at the dual enrollment bill, AB 288. Next slide. You look at AB 2364, which is a significant bill from my perspective, regards to uh, undocumented students are able to take community college courses in high school and pay in-state fees. Look at strong workforce bill, AB 705, got it, pathways. Vision for success. Next slide. The student center funding formula, the college promise, AB 30, uh, AB 2 for college promise the second year. Uh, you also have the this year, AB uh, 132, the uh, post secondary educational trailer bill, which provided $115 million in zero cost textbooks uh, dollars for California community colleges. You also have Senate Bill 1359 regards to having a symbol on your class schedule for uh, free um, digital uh, textbooks and information for students has to be identified in your class schedule. There's a lot of these initiatives that we have. And how do we organize ourselves around this work? Specifically, we start thinking about um, open educational resources. What does that look like? And what I try to tell in, in my talks is that a lot of work for me is grounded in these initiatives to try to make sure that we're not having initiative fatigue but it also connects to our end goal as it relates to student success. So I always want to remind individuals that we, we have to meet the law and what being required from us from the chancellor's office, but we also have to put it in context for our own individual campus. And for me, when I look at these bills, uh, I look at the trailer bill from 132, but I also look at the guided pathways work. And the guided pathways work has basically opened my eyes up as it relates to open educational resources. And I'm gonna tell you why that in a second. Next slide. So we'll talk about Compton College. So we take these initiatives from the state and the chancellor's office, and I wanna talk about Compton College and how this works. So I talked to you about this love story I have, and it was really validated for me on May 1st, 2019, when uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama, on her college signing day, wore a Compton College sweatshirt. And the quote was, Compton College has a great story to tell. So when you're recognized by the former first lady, that tells you that the work that you're doing within your organization is making an impact, but not only in California, but also nationwide. And this right here is a, we have the banners. You can buy the sweatshirt from our bookstore too online, but it's significant as it relates to our history of our organization. Next slide. So Comedy College is 114th California Community College. Uh, we're, uh, we're accredited on June 7th. These are areas that we serve. Uh, we offer 38 certificate programs and 41 degree programs. Our student population in 2018-19 was 11,510, as everyone, um, as most people are experiencing right now, which is the enrollment decline, and everyone is stressing about enrollment decline. Anyone tell you they're not worried about enrollment decline? I'm worried about enrollment decline every day. I wake up thinking about enrollment decline and what can we do to support our students, not only new students but also recruit new students, but also our current students. Next slide. Uh, we had 679 degrees awarded uh, and 213 certificates awarded in 2013, 18, 19. You see a sense of our most popular majors, uh, business administration, administration of justice, childhood education, nursing, psychology, and sociology. But what's interesting about this is that students don't complete those programs. Normally, these are what they put on their application, that this is, a, this is what I want to major in. But when they actually finish, they're mostly majoring in general studies uh, to, to their complete. And you also get a sense of our most popular certificates. So I want to make sure you connect it to the number of certificates and degree programs, 38 and 41. So remember that as we go through this presentation. Next slide. Uh, our budget for last year was about $60 million, uh, four, 403 full-time, part-time faculty. We sit on 88 acres uh, uh, in Compton, and our we service areas is about 277,000 residents. Next slide. So when, you start, when I start to think about 
open educational resources. I, the, the, you want to start talking about some of the data regards to uh, housing, food insecurity, and where your students are at. One thing I do want to mention that Compton service, 61% uh, of our students are uh, Latinx, 23% of our students are African-American, 61% of our students receive uh, some type of financial aid. But then the real issue for me, we start looking at housing and food insecurity of our students. And if you look at our data based off of the California Community College, when they did the statewide data in 2018 and then the 2019, you get a sense of where our students are at. And you see how the number of homeless students, that percentage has, has increased since two, in 2019. But then also students who have housing insecurity declined a little bit, but homeless increased. And then also you see the food insecurity. We did not participate in the survey last year because we want to do it in 2020. We want to do it every two years. And so we're looking forward to participating this fall in the uh, the next study about housing and food insecurity. But the, the gist of this slide is we start to think about start to think about textbooks. If a student has to make a decision regards to food, housing, textbook, what decision will the student make? They're gonna go with food or housing before textbooks. So if a student's experiencing housing and food insecurity, they're not gonna be going out to try to find a textbook for their math course, right? They're trying to figure out how to way to survive regards to housing and also food. And so when I think about housing and food insecurity, I'm also thinking about now open educational resources to try to make college more affordable for, for our students to be able to have access. If they don't, if they ever make it, if we force our students to continue to make a decision between food, a roof on the head, or a textbook, the textbook would never win. So we have to make, we have to do something different. Now. Next slide. So what is that different? Uh, next slide. I want to talk a little bit about Compton 2024 and how we organize ourselves around the work. We know about the initiatives. We know about our students and our student needs. So we, we adopted the completion by design, which is based off research from the Gates Foundation. And this has helped guide us as it relates to our works and understanding where our students are at at the five momentum point. From connection, how we connect with them to our campus, how they enter our campus, how they get through gatekeeper transfer level English and math courses, how they complete 75% of their coursework, how they complete their program. And, then, and at, at the end of the day, we wanna see our students transition to a four year college or university or to a workplace with livable wages. Uh, I, I said this this morning in another talk is that I wanna see more of our students not making $15 an hour. $15 an hour and minimum wage is not enough to live within LA County. So how can we ensure that our students are transferring but, or they go into a, a, a work, they go into a work that have livable wages. So we organize ourselves around this completion by design uh, framework. Next slide. And it's highlighted in all of our plans from our COP 2024, which are educational and technology plan, uh, educational and facilities. We have our technology plan. We have a human resources and staffing plan. We have an enrollment management plan. And we're currently working on the student equity plan. Everything is tied to COP 2024 and also completion by design framework. Next slide. And it, and it focuses on five, our, our whole planning focus on five areas, improving enrollment and retention and completion of our students, supporting our students to meet their educational career goals, support the use of technology. And as you know, through COVID-19, we have experienced the technology and seen the gaps within technology. And I think we have made dramatic improvements in regards to that. We also look at offering more programs in Ally Health and technical fields. Uh, this fall, I'm excited we're starting a, a, a CNA program on our campus and also continue to establish partnerships in our community with our K-12, in, in our community and with our K-12 schools. So this gives you a sense of how we organize ourselves around this work. Next slide. So why am I here? Talk about open educational resources. Uh, why Compton College? Because I think we're bold and innovative. And why are we bold and innovative? Because the faculty, the staff, and administrators are thinking outside the box. Uh, next slide. So in, in the uh, in fall of 2019, as we separated from Oakland College, and I talked about that in the previous slide, we had a uh, Tartar Success Institute uh, in the summer, it was, it was August of 2019, right before the semester began. And at that institute, we had faculty, staff, and administrators, we had over 40, 45 people at this institute for a couple of days. 
And what was fascinating about this, they came up with these different recommendations. So they came up with 10 recommendations of how we can improve student success. And one of the recommendations was, let's fully implement OER campus-wide by fall 2021. This wasn't my idea. I didn't write it up. This was a conversation that happened at that day, at that, at during that retreat. And uh, when I heard it, I was, I was all on board. I said, but how are we gonna do that? So we established a, a, a OER committee as a subcommittee of our academic senate. And at the time, our academic senate president was Amber Gillis. Uh, Catherine Marsh was one of our faculty members who was all the way involved in this. And they created the OER committee as a subcommittee of the academic senate. The committee sent me recommendations on December 13, 2019. And their recommendation was to promote OER uh, by, they had a plan of how we're gonna implement OER. And then COVID-19 hit. So when COVID-19 hit, literally, I did not look at these recommendations at all. And I was so focused on COVID-19. And so then in the springtime, I saw an email from my uh, institutional effectiveness office. It was talking about, you know, we have a survey that was going out to faculty. And I wasn't, I had to go back to my notes to figure out what was happening with OER because we were so focused on the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's no fault to anyone, but we, let me go. There's no fault to anyone we were not focused on it. It's just that we had to deal with COVID-19. Uh, next slide. So we had a survey that went out, we had 85 participants uh, who uh, faculty and uh, full-time faculty, part-time faculty who participated in the survey. And uh, from there, then I looked at the survey and I also looked at the recommendations. I said, you know what? I need to go meet with the, uh, the committee. So in the fall of 2020, uh, before I met with the committee, our one of our librarians put out, they have the uh, Open Educational Resources website. And I saw the website and I was like, okay, this is pretty impressive. And I went to the meeting. So I went to the meeting with our uh, faculty and also, uh, they, had, they had a couple staff in the meeting as well, and we're talking about the OER, and we're trying to figure out, I was listening, to try to understand, okay, how do we get to the end goal of fall 2021 regards to open educational resources, and really trying to understand, how do you get to the end goal? And so, the, you know, in these types of conversation, no fault to anyone, we're talking about, okay, we got to have reassigned time for this, got to do that, got to do this, and, I, and I, I kept going back to, okay, what does it take to get to the end goal? Right before we start talking about reassign time, and before we start talking about we need this, we need that, what what do we want to do? Is it a hundred percent? What does it look like at that end goal? And then just try to start filling that out. Um, and I really started focusing on that. And I put out my message uh, on October 29th to the campus, and I said, you know, what if we were to get to a hundred percent OER by 2035? What does that look like? Right? And it was just a recommendation, just to try to get a conversation going. And at the same time, we started to partner with the uh, Michael Sin 20 mm Foundation in a conversation. And we brought them in as a thought partner, just trying to understand how do we establish a goal and also how do we get to the end goal of actually implementing. Next slide. So we started having conversations and, and continue to have conversations and through these conversations, we actually had our academic senate adopted OER goals, which I accepted on June 15th, 2025. And then we submitted a pro our proposal to the Michelson 20M Foundation uh, for support on June 18th. So we can see the tie-in is that before we submitted our proposal for funding, we wanted to make sure that we had a college-wide goal regards to OER. Next slide. So these are the goals. So the goal is to be at 85 to 100% OER by 2035. And the faculty was very adamant about 85 to 100% because they're not gonna be all courses are gonna be able to go OER. And I totally understand that, but our goal is 25% uh, by 2035, 50% by 2027, 75% 20, uh, by 2035 and 85 to 100% by 2035. And, and our goal is to, let's, let's get to that, but it's, it's incremental, right? And so I'm really excited about that, but the key to this now is what's the next step as we to this work. Next slide. So our 8,500% course utilized OER materials, we have to do that within 14 years. 
And this would be a part of our new plan that we're working on for the college as relates to Compton 2035. So now we have Compton 2024. Our next planning strategic plan will be called Compton 2035. So in our proposal that we submitted to the Madison Foundation, this is about how do we get there, right? We want is establishing partnerships for OER training for the faculty uh, and work with our faculty to training to create OER roadmaps, fundamentals, and also trainers training for for OER trainers and developing a strategic plan to achieve our OER goals. This is critical of what does this look like? Does it look like you have to have a degree that you want to have fully online for fully online, fully op open educational resources? Is that what it looks like? Or is it particular academic programs through our guided pathways to have the OER? I don't know, but we need to create a strategic plan that really outlines how we're going to do this. Provide additional training, uh, for our developers as relates to OER, and then also explore other technologies out there uh, that we have for OER, including our Canvas. But also too, I had to schedule a meeting with our bookstore, and I basically told our bookstore, you're not gonna be selling books in the future. And so your, when your contract comes up, we have to look at a new model for the bookstore. And the reason why I had that conversation early on, because we're pushing OER, the bookstore is gonna lose money. However, the bookstore should be looking at other options anyway. They should be looking at how do you provide services to students outside of books? Can you sell our athletic gear within a bookstore? Can you sell other type of materials within our bookstore that you still can be profitable, but it's not gonna be the same model because what's the key here is that the bookstore are making money off of books. And so the bookstore could end up being phased out at Compton College. Don't know that would happen, but it's possible as we move forward with going to OER. But you have to have those critical conversations now as you begin looking at OER, you start looking at, okay, who would this impact? It's going to impact your students, but it's also going to impact your auxiliary enterprises and your bookstore revenue. So for our campus, our bookstore revenue helps support scholarship. That means our foundation needs to be raising more money once the textbooks are being phased out so we can still be able to provide scholarships for our students. There are impacts that you're going to have regarding the OER. You need to identify those impacts, include them in your strategic plan, and by doing that, then everyone is aware of what needs to happen, and there's that you can release some of those barriers. Next slide. So one of the things I want to tell you as we talk about OER, and I, and I have some resources to share, is the work at Compton College started with the faculty and staff having a conversation about what's important for student success. The CEO was not in that conversation. However, I had to take on the recommendations from the faculty and staff from that meeting about OER. Then we had to create partnerships. And the partnership with the Michael, the Michael 20 MM Foundation has been very critical, but also the partnership with the administration work with the Academic Senate as a part of the goal. Now the hard work begins now regards to developing this strategic plan as it relates to OER. And I recommend for colleges to be able to take a step back and figure out, okay, what do we want to do? What is our goal for OER? And then once you set that, then start to identify ways to, to identify ways to implement a strategic plan for OER. And then you want to infuse it into your strategic plan for the college. So what I'm trying to do now by having a strategic plan is that this strategic plan for OER will feed into the new Compton 2020, 2035 plan for the college. And then OER is gonna be a part of the work that we do as a college, a part of our strategic plan. But it also ties into the affordability. If we're talking about, if we're really talking about student success and we're talking about equity and we're talking about affordability, why not go this route? Yeah, it's gonna cost some money, I get it. It's gonna cost some money for faculty to be able to move in the OER direction. But your budgets are your statements of your values. If you value student success, you're gonna find a way to be able to support OER and the development on your campus. And affordability is gonna be a, a, a recruitment tool for your organizations because you can tell students like you come to your company college, you don't have to pay for textbooks, right? That's a recruitment tool. But then also it helps you with some of your support programs like your EOPS and care, your CalWORKs, that are providing book vouchers to students. They can use that money to support students in another way besides books then we can start really dealing with other issues that students have. But we have to work together as a race to this. 
The next slide talks about some of our resources that I have, uh, some of our, our goals for the college, our collaborative governance, how decisions are made, uh, some of our, our data, our fact book, also put our educational resources, and also information about our professional development. But if I have to give you a couple takeaways from the day, is that the work start from within, create a strategic plan for your organization, identify potential partners to work with you, and establish a goal as ways to open educational resources. And then once you establish a goal, work on developing a strategic plan for the organization that will feed into the college's strategic plan. Because if it's not a college strategic plan, then you'll have issues down the road as it relates to ongoing funding. And thank you very much. And I would like to take questions. So we don't have question, any questions yet, but we had a lot of people that were intrigued by your approach of addressing the bookstore issue sort of um, head on. And I know in a lot of colleges, um, part of the um, income from the bookstore actually supports other campus programs. Is that something that you've dealt with as well in dealing with the bookstore and what happens when your bookstore is not making the kind of money that it's used to making off of textbooks? Yeah, we, we want, as I told, I, I told the vendor, I, I, you have to look at a different way to provide services. And we're gonna have to recoup the money through our foundation and fundraising to ensure we have additional money for uh, some of our, our programming with the student government and also with scholarships. But at the end of the day, our, we have to, the amount of revenue we're generating, we can find another way to, to make that money. And it has to be our priority. But for, for our campus, the, the thing about it is it's outsourced. Uh, so you're not talking about people and individuals, but even if it's not outsourcing your campus, you can figure out ways to sustain a bookstore and provide services, but not also selling textbooks. We have to figure out other ways to generate revenue. Actually, someone made a great point. If you are selling low cost OER in your bookstore, the print version that brings students in to then potentially buy, buy other things if you're like selling selling your t-shirts and your sweatshirts. Uh, so one, one of the things I would tell you is that once, Michelle, when I talked to my staff about this, is that I brought in our, our athletics department. Our athletics department have their own logo and we don't, we don't, there's their branding. And so one of the things is to create a partnership with our bookstore to sell our athletic gear, but not only to sell it to our students on campus, but also sell it on the web and really promote our athletic gear is exclusively sold at this bookstore. And then our athletic department comes up with a lot of nice gear that people are like, oh, I want that. But we don't, we don't monitor, we don't, we're not really selling like we should, but by having a partnership with the bookstore, we can do more. But think about other ways to generate funding. Here's a, here's a good one. Um, how do other college presidents re react to your vision of 100% OER by 2035? I, I don't, from my perspective, I don't know and I don't care, right? <laughs> I think it's important. And I, and I don't want to say, it, and it's recorded and I, and I understand that. My thing is I have to do what's best for my students. And our students are dealing with housing and food insecurity. Our students are dealing with financial aid. Our students are dealing with the, the impact of COVID-19. I need to stay focused on our students. Sometimes you hear people tell you, oh, no, Dr. Curry, you're thinking this is, this is, this is outside the box, this is too much. But if, if you talk to our students and you think about your own experience, right? Your own experience, you know this is what's needed for students. Now the question is, how do you get to that end goal? And so we can't be worried about what other individuals might say about the goal and say, oh, you, I don't know about, it's about, okay, how do I implement this goal? And how do I implement this goal for our community that we currently serve? And think about this, Michelle, and I, and I wanna put this out there, especially with this question. Think about how many colleges are offering dual enrollment at our high schools. We're offering dual enrollments at our local high schools. We're forcing these high school districts to pay for books. And the book might change every two years, depends on your agreement. Think about this from a, from a affordability perspective. And we, especially when you start to look at dual enrollment, AB 288, AB 30, AB 2364. Think about these bills and dual enrollment and high school districts have to continue to buy books for students, right? And the books is always changing. Think about how much of an impact we can have with OER, especially with dual enrollment and exposing students in our community with online technologies that have books and the, the resources. Then they're gonna be educated. And think about the people, their, their family members who are, who are below them, who are coming up to the educational system, who will be able to learn about online open educational resources. Think about that type of impact. 
So we have an opportunity right now by having this goal to really be impactful in so many different areas. And dual enrollment is another area that we have not even, we just touched the surface on as it relates to open educational resources. So we have a number of people that want, want to clone you. We have other people that want that date to be earlier than 2035. Uh, but then we have uh, two questions that I think are related. One is whether or not you had any pushback from faculty. And another is what are you intending to do to compensate or incentivize faculty to move to OER? So let me, let me, let me address a couple of them. First thing is the 2035, I think is realistic. Uh, I just think it, and it could be done sooner. I just think you have to be realistic with it because it, it's, it's, it's gonna take some time and it's gonna take some resources. And I think as we figure it out with the strategic plan, we could, uh, we could, it could, it could happen, but we have to take some time to figure this out. Uh, regards to pushback, I got some pushback um, from the conversation, but it wasn't really pushback to me, right? I look at it, the, the, the uh, online, the Open Educational Resources Committee, I got academic senate, they did the work, right? So they're the ones who came with the, with the goal for 85 to 100%. So I did get some pushback, and when I first put it out in my newsletter, about 100%, uh, we, we, I got some pushback. The question is, how do you get to the, to the end goal? And I'm not too worried about the pushback because there's faculty support for this, and then the academic senate endorsement, and for them to approve this was is critical as we move forward. Um, so I, I hope we can get it done sooner. Uh, the question is going to be, how do you do that? And I don't with the compensation, I don't know what that looks like, and that's one of the things that I struggle with. And I'm, and I'm okay to say it. I'm struggling with it, right? I don't know. I know individuals need to be compensated, but what does that look like? What? How much time does it take? But being have, able to have some honest conversations to figure out what does that look like to develop a compensation model for open educational resources, I think we will figure that out in our in our plan. But I know it's going to cost money, right? I know that. But if you look at our budget this year, and I don't know about any other college, we put $250,000 in the teacher and learning, professional development for faculty for this year, where the different academic divisions put in proposals for professional development, $250,000. Again, if, you, if this is a part of what you do and you value it, the budget is a statement of your values. We put $250,000. So if you look at our budget for Compton College, you will see how we spend our dollars. And so I'm committed to this. The question is, how do you compensate for it? I just don't know. And I don't want to say, oh, we're going to pay this amount of time for each. I don't know what it looks like. And I think that's something that the committee needs to figure out and bring forward some recommendations. I'm not the expert on that. And I shouldn't be. Good answer. Good answer. All right. I've got a couple of very different questions that I've. So one, one person is sort of asking about how you make the connection between um, guided pathways and OER. Um, which I know a lot of a lot of colleges have made that. So it'd be interesting to get your perspective. And another um, question is about. It seems like the primary d driver here is about costs. Um, and now that you have this vision moving, um, will that that emphasis also switch over to considering the other equity aspects of OER adoption, such as open pedagogy and being able to modify resources so that they are. Um, better tailored to meet the needs of our students? Uh, I the, the last part, the last question is absolutely right on, right? I think that this opens up, you know, you st I started the conversation with cost, but it opens up a whole nother area as it relates to equity. And I'm not ignoring that, right? I think it's gonna, it's gonna I think it's gonna create so much uh, change within our organization as we develop OER in all the areas. So the last question, they're right on target, right? So it's not about right now. It's about it started off with cost, but it's gonna it's it's evolving, and it's gonna continue to evolve. And the last question I was asked, they're right on target. That's where it's headed, and you can see it's gonna especially we start to talk about culturally relevant teaching and how you can connect that material to that. I can just see so much professional development for our faculty. I can see so much create materials being created in that area. I'm really excited about that and how it could could tie into the California Community College Chancellor's Office call to action. It's just so it's unlimited opportunities as it relates to OER. So I want to ask that that is totally on target. The next part, the first question, regards to uh, guided pathways, it it brings us a lot of different opportunities in guided pathways regards to OER. And my when when our team talked about it in, in the fall of 2019, 
they were they knew they understood why it was important. The question is, how do we implement it in a way that is equitable? What I mean by that, when you start talking about the first year, the the by 20, 2023 to twenty five percent, which areas are we going to focus on first, regards to OER, and what does that look like? Also, too, how are we going to promote that by guided pathways divisions uh, with our faculty and also with our staff? How do we do that? So I think it brings a lot of opportunities for us as it relates to uh, guided pathways. But I think it will, I think it will encourage students who are particular majors regards to what we have available with open education resources. I think it will help to recruit our students into those particular majors. And I think the workshops and so we have a target success teams on our campus. And I think with the target success teams and the workshops they do for their students by guided pathways divisions and utilizing open educational resources in those types of workshops will also enhance what we do outside the classroom. So I can see it supporting the in-class work that we have, but also I can see it supporting the outside class work regards to the support services and how to link our students to the OER materials outside the classroom and the support. I have to remember to unmute myself. Um, somebody pointed out that if you're relying on OER and you're expecting it to be free, then that really requires that students have stable internet access. Are you doing anything to address the internet, internet access issues for students within this framework? So uh, that's another conversation that we're having, but I, I'm glad to talk about that too. So one of the things that we have done, everyone knows about this regards to COVID-19, everyone's doing Wi-Fi hotspots, make sure you have laptops available to students just any other. I'm thinking about the future of technology and where we're headed. So I've been meeting with LA County regards to the whole digital divide. And I'm trying to figure out ways regards to stable internet within our district for our students that we serve. Not only providing uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, but looking at, okay, what other options do we have available for stable internet for our students? And one of the things we've been talking to uh, the county about was creating a technology hub on our campus uh, that will be open uh, seven days a week for individuals to be able to use internet and have internet access. I also have opened up to the county to be able to um, be able to put up a, uh, a free internet access uh, for, within our community that, that be set up in our, on our campus for individuals. Uh, so we're looking at that, but really trying to partner with LA County regards to the digital divide and creating some partnerships for our students. I, I don't think Wi-Fi hotspots are enough. Uh, I think we need to look at long-term solutions regards to uh, internet access. And one of the things that I would tell you that was very telling to me about this, I had a, a meeting with some uh, faculty and staff on our campus. And one of our staff members said something to me, and I will never forget it. She said, you know, Dr. Curry, we can give out these Wi-Fi hotspots, but we have, if you have multiple people in the household trying to use the internet, some using the Wi-Fi hotspots or what, we got to turn our cameras off because we're trying to be able to stay within the meeting. So my thing is when I look at technology, I want to make sure we have technology where students are able to be online and then I turn their cameras off, right? They don't have to be, they don't have to like figure out a way just to stay online because they have, the service is not that great. So we have to partner with LA County. We have to partner with the state of California to provide the services. We have to make sure that internet is stable for our students to be able to access OER, but also to access support services. But yes, work with LA County and external partners. There's lots of, you're gonna to need to look at the chat afterwards because there's lots of great suggestions and conversations um, and things that, that you, you would benefit from seeing. Um, and also nice, nice statements about things that you have said. I am looking for questions and I don't see any at the moment. Um, I, I, I'm curious as to whether or not you have had conversations with other college presidents. Yeah, I've, I've had conversations with college presidents about uh, OER um, and where they're headed with OER, but I haven't probed about what, what's next as relates to what we're doing at Compton, but I've had conversations uh, I think everyone's just trying to figure this out and what this looks like. Uh, I think we're being we're more aggressive as it relates to it, and we want to we want to be successful uh, as we move forward. But we're, I think our our goal is, is aggressive, even though it's fourteen years, right? I I do think I think I think it's aggressive, but I think we have to be aggressive in this type of conversation. So. Um... 
so back to the, the sources of funding, has Compton College used strong workforce, workforce program funds to develop OER? No, we have not, but that, so for, okay, let me just talk about planning and budget and, and the process. Um, for me, when we're gonna look at budgets, uh, all budget recommendations come to my office. And so that means I'm able to look at all budgets across the board as it relates to funding. And so a lot of times we're, we're picking and choosing budgets to be able to fund different projects. So when it comes to, once we have a plan in regards to OER and the, the plan of action, we're gonna be utilizing multiple budgets, not only strong workforce, general fund, we'll probably utilize student equity and achievement. We're gonna be utilizing multiple funds. And that's just where our budget process works. And it's, for me, it's important because I have, a, I, have a, I have the 100 foot lens, but I'm able to see what's happening in different areas. So all budgets are on the table as it relates for funding. And then we can be able to plug in uh, where we can utilize those funds. But yeah, strong workforce will be a part of that conversation. Uh, student equity and achievement will be a part of that conversation. Guided pathways will be a part of that conversation. I know we have the additional money in guided pathways. So I've been looking at that as well as another source of funding. One of the things that I, I asked the chancellor's office for uh, a couple of weeks ago was I was asking for, I want all the rules and guidelines for every categorical program. So I can be able to see what's allowable, what's not allowable as we start to make these budget decisions as we move forward. And OER is a big one for us. So we need to try to look at, okay, what, what funding pots do we have to be able to realize this goal? I really appreciate that because we've been saying to faculty, work on integrating OER into all of your plans so you have all those different pots of money um, to pull from. Um, can you give us advice for how to convey the importance of OER to our upper level administrators? So one of the questions earlier is, is not just about the affordability, but also about how the uh, culturally relevant teaching, how it connects to the college goals, but also how it connects to legislation. As I began this presentation, I talked about the legislation. If you look at the legislation that, that, I, that I brought forward, that, that I talked about, that I saw my slide presentation, each one of them you can connect to OER, right? Each one connects to OER. You also can connect OER to your strategic plan for your organization. You need to have advocates. You need to have an advocate on your campus who is an administrator, particularly the president, as relates to advocating for OER and really pushing that agenda. And we, but the key is that people have to see the value in it. I was able to see the value in it because I listened to my faculty and staff at that uh, retreat on in August of 2019. And it, it talked about basically, I was looking at affordability and it makes sense to me. The question now is how do I get to the, how do we get to the end goal regards to affordability? How do we get the end goal regards to OER? And it goes also to your question, Michelle, is like really thinking about, okay, we have a strategic plan, how are we gonna fund it? So right now as the committee, it, we got funding for the Microsoft Foundation for $25,000 to create the strategic plan to do the work. But while they're thinking about that, I'm, all I'm thinking about now is funding, right? I'm thinking about, okay, how do we make this a reality? How do we utilize these different pots to make it reality? Because the most frustrating thing I think for faculty and staff is to work on these types of plans and to have these conversations with your administrators and then nothing happens, right? Then when nothing happens, what happens? You're like, I'm done. I'm not gonna do nothing no more. Dr. Curry said, we're gonna do this, that, and the other. He didn't provide the money. I'm not doing it again, right? Why do I wanna waste your time? So the faculty at Compton, I, I gotta deliver. If I'm talking about OER, if I'm talking about the goal, and at the end of the day, I'm saying, mm, sorry, we can't do it. I lose all credibility. And for me, what's important is I have to figure out a way to support the people who are doing the work. At our campus, Dr. Morris, Abigail, Abby, they're doing all this work as the co-chairs. They're the ones who've been pushing it. I had to assign an administrator who can provide some administrative support to help them. But I'm trying to make sure that we can able to get to end goal because I think it's a good, we're doing some really good work. So it's my job to figure that out. But then also I think when you talk about getting other people engaged, we have to tell the story. We have to speak at conferences like this and we have to be vulnerable to say, you know what? I don't know how I'm gonna get to 2035 with strategic plan, but I'm gonna fund it. I do, so um, I, I feel like some of the questions are sort of getting repetitive now. Um, I have one person who's asked, how, what do you think of the trustee members role? So I'm assuming that your board's on board with all of this as well. So the, the board of trustees, 
I have a great board and they're uh, engaged in the work that we're doing and they delegate authority to the CEO to do, to do my job. And so they're supportive of the initiative that we bring forward and they're supportive of OER and the work that we're doing. And they know that we have a goal and they're going to wait to see how we, how we move this thing forward. But this is not a part of their role as board members. Their role as board members is about governance. This here is a, a, a day to day operation of the president CEO relying on the uh, advice of the academic Senate as relates to this matter. And so the board is not involved and engaged in the OER conversation. That's my job. But we also are working, we work with the faculty to try to figure this out. That's a great question, though. Um, yeah, so everyone loves everything that, <laughs> that you've said. Um, thank you so much. Do you have any last um, words for us before we let you go? Uh, my, my last words is that don't give up. Um, I think that for me as a uh, CEO who's been in the position since 2011, uh, 2019 with the separation for El Camino College and being a part of our target support uh, institute in August where I learned more about OER and what we're doing, I've become educated on OER over the last two years. And it's, it wasn't that it was something that was on my radar. It was something that was brought forward to me by the, the faculty and the staff. And I was able to listen to that. So, but I know people get frustrated with this type of conversation because you might not see the movement on your campus as it relates to OER. And my suggestion to you is not to be frustrated, to continue the work, because this is, this is something that's gonna long-term help to change our system uh, within the California community colleges, but also in higher education in California. And we can't get frustrated. We gotta continue to work together. So one, don't get frustrated. Two, uh, I would say you wanna work with the intersegmental piece. And the more individuals we have intersegmental from the Cal State to CSUs, community colleges and privates who are having these conversation, the more powerful we are in this conversation and more people are engaged in that. So to continue to engage, but I also would say we need to engage our K-12 districts. Begin to engage K-12 in this conversation about OER. And I think that's gonna be very helpful to us as we move forward over the next 10 to 15 years, especially around dual enrollment. How do we continue, how do we engage them in this conversation? And the final piece is say thank you to the people who are doing the work. Um, as a college president, look, I'm in meetings all day, I'm speaking. The people on our campus are doing the work. And I said, Abby already, I already talked about Dr. Marsh. I, Dr. Menador is our academic senate president. Amber Gillows was our academic senate president. They did the work, right? That's they are the ones who have been leading this effort on our campus. And I thank them for that. Uh, but I also thank other people too. I think 20M, M Foundation, not because they gave us money, but because they gave us a thought partner who were able to bounce ideas off of to be able to have these conversations. And it's open to say, you know what? I don't know what I'm doing, but I know it's a good idea. Help me try to figure this out. That has been very helpful to me to be able to have friends like that. I know Ryan's on the call today, but even have friends like that who can help you understand it. So, and say thank you to these people. And I think it's important that as educators, we do that. And I know that's my time. I want to say thank you very much. Well, and we thank you so much. Got noise going on. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone else. And again, Dr. Curry, I hope you'll take some time to take a look at the chat. A lot of great conversation in there. And thank you to everyone for joining us.